You're watching Deprogrammed. This is the New Culture Forum show committed to fighting back against the forces of ideological conformity, particularly among the young. My name is Harrison Pitt. I'm a senior editor at the European Conservative, and I'm thrilled to be joined again this week by Connor Tomlinson, the host of Tomlinson Talks at lotuseaters.com, and our special guest this week, Lewis Brackpool, a citizen journalist and the man behind the very appropriately named Lewis Brackpool YouTube channel. Now, Lewis, <laughs> uh, some, some viewers will know that you, uh, along with Stephen Edgington, in fact, mm. are, are, are um, the first person, other than Edgington, of course, to appear uh, more than once on, the, on this channel. Oh. So that's an accolade in itself. Thank you. Uh, and though we like you very much, it's actually not got anything to do with favoritism. <laughs> it's because you were, in fact, present at this rally over the weekend yes. uh, set up for far-right lunatics, or at least that's, <laughs> that's the, um, the impression I got from reading many of the mainstream mm. media sources. Tell us it isn't so. Well, um, yes, it was quite an eventful day. Uh, I went there as a reporter for a particular outlet called The Publica, who uh, the co-directors are The Quartering and uh, Sydney Watson from Australia, now living in Texas. Uh, and I went there just to, of course, scope it out, just to report it. Uh, I didn't trust the media to report it accurately. And um, yeah, I was very surprised uh, to see that no, far right hooliganism, um, no, not really, actually, um, despite what the mainstream media have been saying. Uh, I just tagged along and uh, just filmed absolutely everything. Uh, there was a few things that I wasn't sure about which we can get into, but the day, I have to say, and I try and be as impartial and as balanced as possible, I have to say, it was very pleasant, very pleasant day. It didn't really, so last time when there was <coughs> we had the St. George's Day um, mm. uh, p parade uh, recently, we actually did an episode for Deprogrammed with, uh, on that with our, with our mutual friend, Charlie, Charlie Sansom. Sansom. Mm. Uh, came on to, to talk about that, but there was a sort of a, a scuffle between the people present and the police, but nothing like that took place at this, at this, at this uh, rally of sorts. I personally didn't see anything. The media the following day reported that you had the Dortmund versus uh, Real Madrid match, the Champions League final, I believe, at Wembley Stadium, and that ha had over between 50 to 60 arrests, or roughly. Um, there was a pro-Palestinian march uh, that was separate from uh, this event that had nine arrests and this event particularly only had two um, but I didn't see anything uh, personally not with my own eyes but uh, the media says that there were two particular arrests and uh, everyone was extremely cheery and you know there were all sorts of people going up to everyone else people turned up even on their own yes. which um, you know is Quite a bold thing to do with uh, especially that the media is going to smear you uh, you know it's inevitable for that Indeed. But, um, yeah it was rather surprising I must say well someone who was on their own in the crowd was uh, an onlooker from noted communist rag hope not hate oh, trying right. to live tweet everything and they seemed disappointed <laughs> when people filtered out peacefully and took all their rubbish away from Parliament Square with them unlike many of the Palestinian protests someone else was disappointed as well I remember the Met Police tweeting around midday mm -hmm. saying well, there haven't been any arrests yet. <laughs> and it was very much like, well, yes, Sounds disappointed. you haven't had any active altercations with the crowd. Because w we did see another example of, of when this sort of thing happened was the defense of the Cenotaph process. Yes, yes Armistice um, Day. Mm. In anticipation of the Palestinian march going by it on Armistice Day after they'd already disrespected it and similar people disrespected it during the BLM marches in 2020. And there were scuffles with the police because the people were, were kettled in. As soon as mm -hmm. they got out onto the street near the cenotaph, nothing, nothing happened at all. Completely quiet, yes. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I agree with your assessment that I'm not surprised with a lack of provocation by the police mm. that there were no mass arrests and no encounters of violence. Absolutely. And, and on top of that, um, the Met was thanked after for their service. And you know, the entire, uh, the entire rally march and the screening uh, within Parliament Square was all centered around two-tier policing. So you saw the optics afterwards, but whilst we were there, people were thanking police and uh, they had, it was very well organized. You had stewards as well, yes. um, as part of uh, Tommy's company um, or media organization that he set up. Um, and it was just very well organized. I, I was actually, yeah, I was, I have to say, I was quite impressed by it. Um, I must say as well that I, I think that um, this steward idea is an excellent one because yes. <clears throat> I think it's very clear from, from previous episodes like this that, that the Met Police wants to 
create conditions in which you know people have had a couple of drinks. Yes. Maybe someone will do something silly like th it just takes one person. Of course. Maybe someone will do something silly like throw beer at a horse, which I think is what happened at the at the recent St George's Day march. And then the media has all the headlines it wants. Yes. It can it can stigmatize and demonize this group of white working class yes. patriotic people even more than they've already been demonized relentlessly for for, for many decades. And so this steward idea of having effectively sober volunteers um, who mediate between the police and the more riotous crowd, and they have every right to be riotous, it's the day of celebration, it's a morale boost, we'll get into some of the sure. purposes that it performs uh, afterwards, but it prevents those headlines from being able to be written afterwards. And I, one thing that I struck me as interesting is that they really had very little to, and obviously we still got the headlines, you know, far right, thugs, all this sort of thing, but there was no meat on the bone, and not that mm. there ever is, but, but <laughs> there wasn't even the pretense for there to be much meat on the bone, it was just, it just seemed impotent. This is why I think citizen journalism is so important, and especially in these times within the, the digital age, mm. is because there were so many cameras there. There were so many um, independent media organizations and other citizen journalists there covering it, and everyone just had eyes everywhere. Everyone was, there was that sort of thing in the air to say, could trouble happen around the corner? But there were so many people there ready to cover whatever might happen that I think it sort of contained people. Um, there were a few things, so there were a few things that I wasn't happy about. I mean, I think there was an incident where uh, a particular video was spread online with two young children who were taking part in chants mm. um, with regards to goading and uh, mocking um, uh, the Islamic faith in that way. Uh, I didn't think that that was appropriate and it was only you know a, a minority of people that were engaging in these sorts of chants personally uh, maybe it's because of my faith uh, I don't think that, that provocative nature is helping or helpful um, obviously they're well within their right to to chant what what they like mm. in, in my view in my utopian world no, no, we're, talking, we're talking about whether they should mm. not whether they can exactly yeah. exactly and so there was that, and I, I wasn't, I didn't approve of that personally. Yes. But um, there's, there wasn't a lot really to, to say um, in terms of anything really negative. I mean, I even watched Michelle Jubry uh, mm -hmm. on uh, GB News, her analysis of it, and even she was like, "Yeah, um, I don't see far right hooligans here." For, mm. for example, at the front of the march, you had um, these lovely old old older uh, ladies in mobility scooters essentially leading it and I thought oh are these the far right hooligans that are, have they just come <laughs> off the Real Madrid win like do you know what I mean I, I, it's that, just this is not what the rise of fascism looks like <laughs> yeah literally <laughs> in mobility scooters <laughs> either that or it's exceptionally slow and therefore you can get away with it with ample time exactly, just yeah. increments yeah. <laughs> but um, it raises the question of why do we keep seeing this term far right being bandied mm. around and personally I think it's such a difficult um, label to define in itself, uh, far right, because when I think far right, I think of the Azov Battalion. And if you compare the ladies in the mobility scooters to Azov Battalion, bit of a difference. Um, so I, I think that power within the smearing, the smear merchants within the media class is failing in real time. And I think people are making their own minds up. And that's why, going back to my original point, citizen journalism is so key and so important, especially in this era. Yeah, well, one of the people that was up on stage making a speech, as, as well as yourself, I mean, we'll cover the contents mm. of what you said shortly, was one of my colleagues, Carl Benjamin, yes. over at the Lotus Eaters. Mm. And one of the things he said was that you should act as if your ancestors are watching and therefore be on your best behavior. And he wasn't booed or heckled for telling everyone to be orderly and wholesome and respectful. Yeah. Everyone applauded because that is the behavior befitting yes. the country that we want to see a return to the standards of, for example. Sure. So I, I do think that was, that was very much the undercurrent. And then if I might just say, I agree with you with the smears way <laughs> waning this week because yeah. uh, on, a, on a personal level, I had a very mm. polite chat with former Prime Minister Liz Truss and, thanks to Hope Not Hate, uh, Labour Party MPs, Sky News, Byline Times, other smear outlets decided to misreport the goings on and lost their collective minds over it. Yeah, yeah. But Liz Truss was not deselected. She 
did not back off of us, even when Rishi Sunak was asked, and Rishi Sunak is a very tepid man that we don't particularly like in terms of policy or messaging, even he said, I'm not interested, I'm, I'm getting on with campaigning, not today, thank you very mm. much. I do think that they've cried wolf so many times now that mm -hmm. that smear far right, which is obviously meant to be synonymous with Nazi, that's why Azov Batalion yeah. came to mind, yeah. it's ludicrous because no, me, a Catholic Englishman, is not celebrating 1930s German race socialism, thank you very much, and neither is anyone else with thousands of hours on camera and in articles. I, I, I do think Hope Not Hate and, and the like have just waned in their power. And I think, I think a lot of people feed into their sort of power, um, you know, I think we give them too much credence in terms of what they, what they want to achieve in terms of smearing people and taking people down and, you know, harassing people, doxing people. I think if you, they're just to be, these communists just need to be ignored. And I think that's just the simple fact of it. And I think people get a bit sort of worried about these types of little NGO groups that have ties to, to the establishment. I think we give them too much power than they actually have. Um, so they're just to be ignored. And they, and they certainly have nothing even close to resembling an argument um, and no. even the people who are not necessarily as sort of rabidly race communists as the people at Hope Not Hate itself um, but they're sort of media enforcers who I actually suspect off, much of the time are actually just a bit a bit dim frankly. Um, lazy. Lazy, dim, you know w w speaking of the, the way that Hope Not Hate tried to smear both Liz Truss and the Lotus Eaters mm -hmm. um, recently because Tomlinson. It was poor Connor, journalism Connor, anyway. It was dreadful yeah. journalism, but I just saw Lewis Goodall's sort of normie diatribe <laughs> about it, and he was just saying, he was, he had, he had nothing even close to resembling an argument. He was just sort of hectoring sass and sort of moralistic attitudinalizing, just saying things like, you know, this group is very unpleasant and this, <laughs> you know they're, they're, they're politically eccentric and using these words and then likewise yesterday uh, a, a similar sort of person not a media person but Lu Luciana Berger who I, think, who I think was on with Michelle Dubry mm. like I say yesterday oh, but, it, yes. but not, it, 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 this will be going out on Thursday but I think it was yes, yesterday evening or the, or the evening before mm. Luciana Berger was on when, with Michelle Dubry and Michelle Dubry was just going well what's far right about these A yeah. define far right B point to any examples and Luciana Berger was just saying well you know I, um, uh, had, had nothing, yeah, had nothing, and just c calling people like uh, Tommy Robinson uh, a thug. And I, I remember thinking about Luciana Berger in particular. Um, by the standards that you're invoking to describe someone like Tommy Robinson as far right, mm. i.e., someone who is a nationalist, who believes, who is against the Islamization of Britain, is against the way in which our sort of um, social fabric and our, our settled traditions are being completely watered down and bombarded and undermined by waves and waves of immigration from parts of the world which just don't have a share in that. Mm. I, I, I just thought I'd do some digging into Luciana Berger's opinions. She is em emphatically in favor of all of those things for, is for Israel. So right. by her, the, the stand, and I don't, uh, I don't hold that against her one bit. Well, so is Tommy Robinson. So is Tommy Robinson. He yeah. creates himself in the I Israeli flag. Exactly. Almost all of these protests. And yeah. I, don't, I don't hold her, I get that against her one bit. I don't hold it particularly against Rob, uh, against Robinson, either. And I just remember thinking, why can't we get in on some of that action? Like, what are these insidious double standards which count against European countries, and uh, w why are you peddling them such that by the standards you invoke in Britain, you are yourself far right in Israel? So maybe just don't use that term because you're, all you're doing is potentially shooting yourself in the foot logically. There's, there's a part of me that I want them to keep using the term so it's so watered down That's that true. it just is destroyed. Indeed, the language, language inflation. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, what, what did she say uh, on GB News? I don't want to get it too wrong. <laughs> Who? She, uh, uh, the lady who said, w uh, when Michelle Dubry asked, uh, can you define what far right is? Luciana Berger. That's it, yeah. yeah. She. I think she sort of said, anyone who's right of the Conservative yeah, she did, Yes, she, she sort of did. And, I'm, and I was sitting there going, really? What, the yeah. Liberals? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you know, yes. the Liberal establishment. Yes. Oh, gosh. Noted, noted far-right man, Andrew Doyle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Helen Joyce. And it's just 80% of the nation. All it's that so happens. incoherent. But, and I agree. And, and so this is where we, with the, we'll, we'll move on a tiny bit. Um, but I think it is important to say that, so I've noticed, I definitely think we're right that this doesn't have as much power um, in, intrinsically, as many people are loath to think that it does. Nevertheless, I do think it has more than people who, like us, who consider ourselves rightly very red pilled on these matters, very, the way past being uh, being put off by these sorts of scare words. Essentially, 
I do think that there is still a significant contingent of people in this country who probably share 95% of a worldview with someone like Tommy Robinson mm -hmm. or with someone like um, Lawrence Fox, but are a little more middle class, a little more um, guarded about their social status and would not want to be lumped in or associated right. with, with them. Not, and I'm not saying that they're right to think this, but most people, and there's lots of evidence on this, most people, even people who, put it this way, uh, this is an example I use. Tom Tugendhat, after the St. George's Day mm. Parade, described these people as racist, fascist thugs. Okay, that is disgusting, mm. that is untrue. Like, to Tom Tugendhat is a question for saying that. Um, and, I'm, and I've no, it, it, it sickens me, frankly, to see these people sneered at in this way, particularly mm. given what they've been subjected to involuntarily over the last 30 to 40 years in terms of having their own communities completely, mm. well, the, as Connor likes to put it, the, the world arriving on their doorstep, dropped on their doorstep. Um, but Tom Sugenhardt is not going to be punished electorally for saying that. And he lives in a 95% middle class, well, 95% white British, middle class, leafy suburban constituency in Kent. If this, why is he not, it, it, it's, yeah. what, what I'm getting across here is that I do think that, that um, this still has some power over certain people and that therefore it behooves us to be uh, tactically minded about how we um, uh, go about. We don't want to be s sort of self-immolatingly populist for its own sake. And I, I wonder if you have uh, any, any thoughts about that. What do these marches, ap apart from being a morale boost, which is very important, by the way, what do they actually achieve practically? Uh, good question. Um, from what I can see, uh, as a reporter going there, is like you mentioned about a morale boost. I do see it as one massive boost for people with these views. Um, you know these concerns uh, with regards to immigration, two-tier policing, uh, being treated differently, um, and not having a say, not having a vote, feeling almost left out or pushed out. So people feel encouraged that there are there are people saying, "Do you know what? I'm sick and tired of this. I want to actually do something." And that's why, as much as some people like to argue that protests don't work, petitions don't work, or anything like that. The, the substance, the foundation of these, these practices, even if you believe that they don't work or don't bring anything to the table, there is a community there. There is a foundational um, coming together there. And I think that is incredibly important. And I think optically it's changing. I mean, even just looking at the viewership, at one point over 900,000 people tuned in to the live stream of that event uh, concurrently. That's huge. It's probably one of the most live streamed political events uh, in British history for, well, I, I dare I say ever. ever. Um, so I think it creates, it creates a kind of, um, I want to say hope in a way. Uh, this is the vibe that I'm getting from other people and speaking to other people there. People were just so happy that they were with like-minded people. Uh, because they felt like, like I said earlier, they were just pushed out. So I do think that these events are important in terms of a morale boost, um, considering every Saturday has been uh, <laughs> rather different <laughs> for a long rather, time. Rather more blackpilling. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, you know, and people have the right to protest in my view, uh, you know, whatever you feel. But to have something like this, uh, that's aimed specifically towards um, working class Brits is it's it's refreshing yes I, that's the only way I can sort of come up with at the minute and that's that's from someone that wanted to go there try try to be as balanced as possible yes <laughs> but you know having handshakes like every five minutes <laughs> yes. from all, all friends within uh, sort of the independent media realm and it, it was just you know wonderful to be around so. yes yeah, I, I, one of our mutual friends described this as the political equivalent of a pop concert, and that wasn't <laughs> in a disparaging fashion. And I think rather than to disparage it, uh, the participants and those who didn't attend, like we, we weren't present at the day, uh, should see it not as a recruitment pool for mm -hmm. the next group of reactionary MPs that are going to implement a feasible legislative Prospectus. That's the one. Uh, but rather that this is something to be looked at with 
OK, we, can, we have a constituency here whose concerns are valid. They raise their grievances in a non-violent fashion, and it takes the fangs <coughs> out of the smears leveled at them, which has been the manufactured consent to roadblock all of those pieces of the legislative agenda being passed through in recent years. So even though it's not the <coughs> required vanguard movement mm -hmm. to change the institutions from within and enact legislation, it is good for morale and it also shows that we are people of upstanding character and mm -hmm. those people that we would like to live in a civilization with are of upstanding character, even if they're smeared as far-right racist bigots, etc. Contrast that with the Palestine protests, which are being unfairly policed. They're shooting fireworks at police horses, mm -hmm. attacking police officers. Climbing on our most precious monuments. Exactly. They're defiling the graves of our ancestors who have fought and died to keep this country mm. beautiful and free. And that sets us apart from them, and I think that's probably the useful function it serves. It's, um, you know, I don't know about you chaps, I do feel that there is change happening. I do, I do feel like there is something in the air, and we'll be getting on to, at some point, talking about the recent news with regards to Farage, but uh, I don't know about you chaps, I do feel like that there is something in the air now, something that's changing within not only British politics, but just in general. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite encouraging. Well, well, let's get into it now then on the Farage point because I, I think, again, we're filming this on Tuesday, but, and I think it is, it is today, i.e. two days ago if you're watching now, which you should be, um, when if that Farage formal, not formally announced his campaign in, in Clacton. Mm -hmm. And the, the crowd he was w able to summon on a, on a day's notice yeah. is pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I saw the video earlier on the train up here and uh, I just had to post it and it reminds me of 2016 all over again. Mm -hmm. um, that was, that beat the communist out of me, uh, that, <laughs> that event, um, leaving, leaving, quote unquote. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've not seen this, this type of buzz for a long, long time. I mean, people were reacting uh, from, you know, the communist side, mm -hmm. uh, saying things like, well, here's a video of Jeremy Corbyn at Glastonbury. And I, I thought, well, they're there for music. Exactly. <laughs> so that's yeah, yeah, not yeah, really a valid a, argument. That's a, um, a very invalid argument. Yeah, very invalid, exactly, <laughs> yeah. And I thought, hmm, that doesn't stand up. Um, <laughs> but I do see this buzz. Now, <laughs> I... It's, just like the, it's like the World Cup final taking place and Diane Abbott happens to get a ticket. <laughs> like seeing, look at the crowds that Diane Abbott was willing to sell yeah, yeah, at Wembley. 90,000 people to hit Diane. She, she, did, she did show up at half time though. She couldn't, <laughs> she couldn't get out the door because she couldn't locate her right shoe at the time. <laughs> Exactly so. so I, actually, just have to, I just had to make that barb and Connor had to follow it up. I'm anyway. actually gutted she's not going to be in. Like, she's not actually going to be an MP. She, she, is. Is. she is. Oh, she is. is she? Yeah, they've yeah. just released their candidate selection on Tuesday, time of recording, and she's the hack. I didn't see this. Candidate. Really? Yes. So, yeah, there's plenty more laughs to be had. Look. She'll be the mother of the house. <laughs> She will be. Yeah, she will be. Oh, this that's is going to be great. That, 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 that this is, is going to be great. We're going to get more bangers, <laughs> like uh, apologetics for Mao's genocide. Oh, yeah, yes. Mao did more good than harm. Yeah, yeah quite. Yeah. Yeah, Nigel Farage is the one that's, that's widely oh, yeah. protested and condemned again as far yeah. right. But, but mm. to, more to the point of the Glastonbury thing, mm. not only were the crowd already gathered there for music, but they weren't, they weren't his specific constituents. No. This is the people who would give a direct outpouring of support on the 4th of July. Yes putting X in, in the ballot box next to Farage's name. And mm. a lot of people have been saying, right, his social media game is far better. Yes, he's, oh, way better. He, he clearly has brand recognition. He's got a kind of thumos and a vitalism and a joy about him. He's introduced a, a jubilance and a feeling yeah. of inevitability to an otherwise mm. very sclerotic election cycle. And the thing he said up on stage that, that really got me thinking, I think this applies to all us chaps here, um, despite you being a couple of years older than us, <laughs> you millennial, is that he was saying across <laughs> Europe and the US, there is something happening with Zoomers. And that is uh -huh. that young right-wing men have realized they've been robbed, dispossessed from an inherited culture, opportunities to own a home and have their own family. That prospect has been definitely deferred mm -hmm. well beyond the age of their grandparents. That their wages and job prospects have been depleted compared to the rest of the world. And they're annoyed about that. And until now, they haven't registered any polls because there has been no right-wing party in, in the UK. The Conservatives yes. have utterly betrayed them. I would wager that, that sort of Sky News poll Matt, that came out the other day that said reform wouldn't get any seats. Mm. There's going to be a shift then. It's because of young young men. I've noticed something as well, um, touching on the reaction to Nigel Farage pulling in that crowd in Clacton um, after 24 hours. There's a lot of sneering at the, the demographics of the people there um, being maybe above 50, 
uh, roughly, I'm very sorry <laughs> if that's incorrect, but uh, above 50 um, and white. And the sneering from the left, hating um, the fact that, dare I say, that um, the older demographic actually coming together and uh, watching someone that they really like um, announce them to be a, a candidate. I mean, name me another politician that has done something like this uh, in at well, I've not seen it in my lifetime. I'm too young to uh, remember any of the Tony Blair uh, days and the buzz around that. But with regards to seeing that, the sneering is just, I mean, it's, un it's predictable, of course, but I just, I couldn't believe the amount of people who were sneering at, it was almost like to say, yeah, let's lower the voting age to 16, but then let's stop anyone from voting 50 plus and who happens to have um, a pigmentation that they dislike. Particularly in a place like Claxon as well, which mm. is not, you know, leading the world in terms of, it's one of those left behind Essex uh, seaside yeah. towns, which yeah. and 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 these are our compatriots. These are our fellow people, and and we sh and we should. The the fact that a political figure is able to summon a crowd like yeah. that in a town that must be, in many respects, experiencing deep seated disenchantment, not just with polit the political process, which is one thing, but with life itself. Yeah, is, that's not nothing to be scoffed at. Absolutely. There are some things uh, to play devil's advocate. <laughs> oh, we're going to agree on those, I'm sure. Yeah, Let's uh, go. with regards to Farage. Net zero immigration. That's a terrible idea. Terrible idea. And this is, this is not something that the young Zoomers will support. And this is something that needs to be questioned on. Yes. Richard Tice, about two weeks ago on Julia Hartley Brewer's show, when Julia questioned him on this, said, how is the healthcare system going to function? Much like, as we've, as we've said before. You mean Camilla Tomini? Uh, no, 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 Julie Hartley oh. two weeks ago. To oh, sorry, Connor, sorry, yes. sorry. <coughs> Much like uh, the addict going, how will I survive without my happy powder? How yeah. will we, yeah. the health and social care sector, function yeah. without infinite yeah. numbers of sometimes fraudulently qualified migrant nurses? And Richard Tice said, don't worry, we, we have a net outflow of 500,000 people, so we can welcome that same number, half a million people. Mm. Nigel Farage, the other night on Camilla Tolomey's show, up that to 600,000 because of the mm. new net migration statistics. That doesn't address the, the problem of cultural decline no. yes. that is seen with areas that are deprived, like Clacton, where young entre enterprising Brits mm. go abroad to America or Australia or Dubai because the earning potential is higher, taking away the possibility to be custodians of their own culture yeah. and just substituting the, someone in as a sort of mercantile actor without any consideration of their culture. And, and that doesn't them, address that. And making them a citizen within two years. Yeah, as it's, well. It's, it's another point. magic soil argument. What, what we essentially need is, is, is tougher restrictions than that, I think. Yes. There is also another thing with Farage that a lot of people are talking about that they are not happy with. And I think, rightly, someone does need to ask him the question because he had a questionable, very, very questionable endorsement of Tony Blair uh, during the madness era uh, of the past couple of years of him wanting to roll out you know what. Um, and in, in relation to the COVID pandemic, we, yes. will, we will stipulate, yes. Yeah. I, I, I will say, so I'm sure reforms answer to this because I know that Richard Tyson and David Bull have faced similar questions about mm -hmm. their endorsement of mandates in the past mm -hmm. and they themselves have said that is not their current party position and that they want to open an inquiry into excess deaths that might be related to that particular intervention mm. but i think it's worthwhile asking nigel himself what he thinks because he has said he's still friends with president trump he still yep. wants to campaign with president trump if he's not now not running in clacton yep. trump himself has faced similar criticism for his base Mm. for that measure yes and has since warp speed rolled yeah. some of that back so it, it would be worthwhile asking i think because lots of people particularly in this audience are interested in accountability for the pandemic they're not going to get it from the labor party who called for harder faster lockdowns and mandates right. they're not going to get it from the conservative party who have sunk all those costs in that particularly because they're running the architect of the furlough scheme that caused inflation mm. so if there's someone that's going to try and hold them to account, it would, it would probably be best to ask reform to do so. Mm. My sense with Farage is that j during that dreadful period in our history where the idea that you can take anything from the English but their freedom <laughs> took a bit of a hit in my mind, I thought that we would be much more sort of, I think we, I thought we would have much more moral fibre to be resistant of yes. that. And in many ways, I know I, the reason why I use the word moral is because I think one of the most alarming things about that period was that freedom didn't carry, the, the, the concept of 
you know, an Englishman's home is his castle, you know, uh, uh, freedom of association, freedom of speech, all of yes. these sorts of Anglo values, principles. Uh, they didn't carry any moral cachet anymore. They had to prove themselves. They had to yes. prove themselves against rival pragmatic arguments. It was a sort of it was a it was a time at which sort of utilitarian pragmatic concerns completely rode roughshod over our, our sort of moral traditions. You had to they had to be, as I say they had to be proved. They weren't they weren't sort of pr um, uh, axiomatic axiomatic anymore morally axiomatic. Even if we're going to be so what I mean is is that in China um, it, the, the, the 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 model that they have there and we did become more like the Chinese. Um, Jeremy state. Hunt is very much, yeah, very so, much so. And it's, it's the Chinese model for it. Graham Allison, who's a, who's a sort of sinologist, American sinologist, calls it responsive authoritarianism. In other words, there's no, there's no reason why a Chinese person can't enjoy a certain um, amount of, of, of freedom in his own personal life. But, 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 um, if it can be proved that it is in the interests of the state, in, in, its, in its sort of paternalistic authoritarian wisdom, to violate said freedom, then that freedom is going to fall for by the for, for, for the greater good. That freedom <laughs> is going to fall by the wayside uh, sooner or later, um, and that's precisely what we lived through here. But I think with bringing it back to to Farage, it seems to me that he, I think it has something to do with his populism, frankly, mm. that he didn't speak out as fulsomely against lockdown as I suspect he wanted yeah. to, being a kind of libertarian by nature, uh, which is sort of what Farage is. Um, in, in many respects, although not, uh, not not a libertarian at the borders, it must be admitted, and, and <laughs> a good thing too that he's not a libertarian at the at the borders. But, and what, what what I mean by that is that whether we like it or not, and this and you, it's true as well that the, the British people were sort of systematically uh, co conned by government messaging into believing mm. uh, the kind of the panic around around COVID. There's, there's, that's no doubt true. But it, but if you look at all opinion polls at the time, there was no real mass popular appetite, particularly in the mm. first six months. I don't know whether Connor would agree with me, I don't know whether you'd agree with me, to, to, to roll back lockdown. The, the public were massively on board with it. And I think Farage, being a, uh, you know, a, a populist genius, frankly, took note of that and kept, kept his powder dry. And now he's criticizing it a bit more, but it wouldn't have been prudent for him on his own populist terms to mm. have been so at the time. It's the window, the Overton window at the time. Indeed. Um, playing Ooh. it safe. Indeed. Quite, quite, quite that, something else that I think reform do need to address mm. and this is of interest it was mentioned to Richard Tice at the New Cultural Forum's annual conference is hope not hate which is something that we've brought up before yes. they have deselected candidates based on their smear pieces yes. um, for example my, my colleague Bo yeah. uh, said that there may be over a million people who have no right to be in Britain since 1997 who need to be sent back according to reform that's their policy in terms of returning all illegal migrants home and since 2017 there's an estimate there might be as many as 1.2 million people here on visa overstays or have snuck into the country yes um, i think they need to do something very serious around the activist grievous industrial complex and rather than capitulate to them in future which is something i think that lots of the prospective voters are actually worried about they need to they need to enact a policy and promise to dismantle it don't forget the candidate that he went to go and fire and turns out they were dead that. <laughs> that was that was I unfortunate. Didn't see that. Did you see, I did see not that. see this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. Responding to a hit piece uh, by Hope Not Hate, and turns out that he passed away. <laughs> oh God, it's terrible. And uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't fully understand the the, the nature because of the something story. something that was posted online. Yes. Uh, and they went to deselect him, and then he, uh, Tice was horrified to find out that. You know, I see. Yes, yes. He said he hadn't no been idea. active for some time, and the reason he hadn't been active as a candidate was because he'd sadly died. Mm. Oh my god! That hadn't been yeah, realised. So just, just, just shoring up basic operations, things like that. Yes. Especially if you're trying to be proximate to power and be the opposition mm. as they're yes. pledging. But also, if you want to get the young right on side, as Nigel said, there is a, there's a massive cohort ready for it. You need to do more on migration, and you need to ensure that you're not going to capitulate to our enemies, as the Conservative Party have for the last 14 years. Yes, and it's, and it's done them <coughs> really next to no good as well. Uh, just, the, just in terms of just pure economic incentives as well. If, if, if your sworn enemies are trying to dig up dirt on you and they find s some kind of pseudo dirt and try and spread it around West, Westminster, if you capitulate, as we're talking about, I mean, they will come for you again because they will yeah. smell blood in the water. And like I a think, shot. Uh, like a shot. Yeah, and yeah. The, this whole Liz Truss episode with the, the Lotus Eaters is that really, really, really instructive in that sense. And I think as Connor said to me, both on live on the Lotus Eaters live stream last week, but also in private, this shows that Rishi Sunak has capitulated to hope not hate less 
than Richard Tice has. And, Rich, and Rishi Sunak is not being massively punished for this. It, 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 no one's talking about this anymore, apart from us, of course, because it, we, can, we, can, we can milk it a bit. But um, <laughs> just for the, the BBC are still whining about That's the true. inaction. But it doesn't matter. But they just look impotent. Yeah, the only, the only they don't time, look powerful. The only time, and I will absolutely credit Richard and Reform on this, um, was when they stood to gain from admitting Lee Anderson as a defector from the Conservative Party mm. because Lee is a popular and effective communicator and he said frankly what a lot of people were thinking around two-tier policing and the Conservative Party threw him out for that yes. and drew a false equivalency between Islamic extremism and the glorification of prescribed terrorist group Hamas with the phantom far right who again have not yet materialized and they, mm. they took him on for that I just wish that they'd also have that attitude with some of the lower profile candidates yes. that wouldn't immediately net them a seat in Parliament yes what do we think then, gents, about, so obviously we've got an election coming up, I suppose it does behoove us to talk about it, uh, <laughs> even dull though it is, although as we were saying, it's just got a, it's just been, I think, as Farah said yesterday, it's just been gingered up a little bit, which is, <laughs> which, is, which, which, which is something. What do we positively want to achieve in, in, in this election, and by we I mean uh, sort of red-pilled um, right-wing patriots, I suppose? I personally, I don't know what you guys <coughs> think on this, I think the best possible outcome that I could possibly see is a hung parliament and I know some people might go what but I'm very in favor now of pro proportional representation um, and I know there's a lot of disagreements with that um, but I think people are so people have an appetite for change now especially when it comes to the system whether it be through voting I know a lot of people who are not going to vote in this election and and you know I was one of those but I've actually shifted now because I see that Labour is going to is going to win anyway. Um, we know this, and I'm a bit of a zero seats guy. I know you're not. <laughs> well, no, I, 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 will, um, I will interject as to why. But yeah, please yeah. continue. Um, this, this is predicated on electoral revenge, personally, because I feel let down from the past 14 years. It's justified, and you know, I I want something else to rise from it. I don't. I I'm not the the Peter Hitchens now saying that. Uh, <laughs> No, we should actually we should actually bring the Tories back or whatever. We should vote for, for the Tory Party uh, to stop Keir Starmer. And it's like, they're, they're, to me, there's no difference that much. You may find small, tiny bits of, of detail like differences, but really, we're still seeing Agenda 2030. We're still seeing uh, mass migration. Nobody has the the gonads to actually do something and to actually give give the the British working middle class an actual uh, bit of representation, a bit of voice. Um, so with PR, I see a way of just changing things up a bit, getting some smaller parties, some representation. Yes, the process or the democratic process of mm -hmm. enacting policies is a lot slower, it's a bit more sluggish, and yes, we know that within Parliament and the House of Lords, it is very sluggish. Our politics is not like the American system, completely different, it's very slow. However, what we're seeing now with Farage um, is something, it's, it's a bit of light again, it's a bit of, it's something, there's a bit of change, there's an opportunity to make some form of change and personally I think that's that's the way I'd like things to go but I'm open to, to, to better ideas if there are. Connor wanted to interject. Okay, so I understand the Zero took me down. Zero, no, <laughs> zero, so I've got an article that should be out by the time this podcast airs for the critic that's mm. in the case against zero seats. And it's not that I'm trying to delegitimize the desire to punish the Conservatives for 14 years of betrayal. Believe mm. me, I'm mm. on board with that. But there's, there's a realistic angle to this in that they are not going to get zero. They're going to get no. around 80 to 100, probably. The worst projections I've seen is 66, but even then, some of those are... a poll for 33 or something That seems well, absurd. Which is a bit absurd. Zero yeah. seats is a bit symbolic, it must be said. Zero seats is the Trumpian yeah. big ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it, yeah. It, it forwards a position, and then we can negotiate back from there. So what do we negotiate back from there? Okay, special carve-out exemptions, because leftists, delusional people like Carol Vorderman are advocating for tactical voting. Special exemptions for our allies who have tried to transform things in cabinet and been blocked by the one nation types and, and the quangos and, and the like, mm -hmm. and some of the backbench MPs who are our strongest advocates in the Tory party, who are most likely to form some kind of coalition or pact with the few reform MPs that could get elected, which is most likely to be Lee Anderson and Nigel Farage. Okay, mm -hmm. so- And then possibly Tice in Boston and Skegness. Yes, possibly Tice as well. So whether that's 
Suella Braveman has been very much cozying up to Nigel, and even though I, you know, she's got Jewish family members, so that's why she's most concerned about the Palestinian marches. I'm not Jewish, I've never been to Israel, but they would as much like to kill an Englishman like me as her relatives. So I am very on board with her saying, shut down those, those weekly marches, which is just a, a, a blight on Britain at this point. Um, after the events of the last week, Liz Truss coming out and saying that hope not hate are fundamentally evil and I'm not going to back down and throw a marginal conservative media outlet like the Lotus Eaters under the bus. So I have respect for that. Um, and I do think that she's bringing, not to be disparaging, bitter ex-girlfriend energy to the Tory party. And I think that's <laughs> what we need if we're going to have a reform from within. And, and folks like Miriam Kate who have repeatedly since being elected in 2019 tried to make good on their mandate <coughs> tried to deliver lower migration been a thorn in the side of their own party and mm. deserve to be returned and i think we are in a much better place to advocate for transforming a right-wing party in opposition whether mm. that's under pr or whether that's under first past the post if we have our allies in power i think though we have to be careful in regards to um defections because you don't want a Tory light, and you, you, no. we, I think there needs to be strong vetting. Uh, I, I'm very completely, in favour of strong. True. It's, I just, you don't want Tory light again. So there needs, yes. if reform is serious, I know they've been very strong on vetting uh, people through yeah, vetting <laughs> to the, right, the wrong direction. Through vetting the wrong in the, direction. Vetting in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> um, but they need to stand firm and look at the voting history. Uh, of candidates, what is, what is it they stand for, what are their previous votes on, yes. um, and to actually Don't throw a lifeline to wets. Exactly. Don't throw a lifeline to yeah, wets. Yeah, no wets. But also, I, but that same concern, Lewis, and I, and I share everything you've said, but I, I must push back a tiny bit sure. on the, on the uh, pr proportional representation sure. thing. I'm, and not because I'm dogmatically and, and emphatically against it, I'm a little bit torn, but I think I still want to stick with our first past the post system. Precisely because the very problems that we've seen with mm. Tony Blair's complete revolution in British politics and his, his the, the entrenchment of the blob and these yes. and these quang, the, the quangocracies and these mm. internet is precisely that not the main argument that people make against first past the post or sorry or for first past the post is that it secures strong government. I think that done properly, what it secures as well, in addition to strong government, is maximally accountable government. Because what you get right. in, in the continent, in places where they do have proportional representation, is you get much more on, on a sort of on a numerical basis, much more representation for these sorts of restrictionist concerns. So Het Wilders is doing, mm -hmm. obviously, tops the polls in the, in the Netherlands recently, and you've got people like Georgia Maloney. But they then have to engage in backroom deals yes. where accountability is necessarily dispersed and where exactly those sorts of Tory light people are going to have a hand in the, in the formation of an next government. I would much, I think that what we'd be much better off sticking with our first past the post system, but emphatically replacing the Tory party, doing that vetting that you're talking about, maybe bringing in some of the people who des deserve to have a lifeline thrown into them, let everyone else drown, not figuratively, not literally, uh, in, in, in political terms, and then that we, we won't encounter those sorts of problems that Giorgio Maloney is already encountering yeah. in, in Italy and which I suspect Hurt Wilders will encounter, will encounter in, the, in the Netherlands as well. I think I'm just, I'm just smelling Anger. blood. Yeah, I'm <laughs> vengeful. Uh, you know, 14 years, we could have done so much, rolled yes. back Tony Blair policies and just, we could, have, we could have done so much, but we haven't. And I think that's, that's why I'm so inclined to see something different, to see whether it would work. It, it's a bit sort of experimental, but I don't know. That that that's just me. It's all it's all born out of vengeance. It's a time of political ferment, indeed. So yeah. we'll see we'll see what happens. Well, listen, Lewis. It's been a real privilege to have you on uh, you. again, Connor. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, my friend. You've been watching Deprogrammed. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment if you wish to do so, and we shall see you on the next one. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. 
it's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.